Okay, I'm just gonna give a, a thank you all for all those com for those really, really um, thought-provoking presentations. And I'm without further ado, I wanna move into our panel discussion. But before we do that, I did wanna introduce um, another member of our panel who is, is going to join us, um, and um, his name is Dr. James Hamblin, and many of us may be familiar with Dr. Hamblin. Um, he is a writer and senior editor at The Atlantic, and he co-hosts the series If Our Bodies Could Talk, which um, I'm very familiar with, and I am look forward to, to hearing more about that. Um, and for that, he was a finalist for the Webby Awards for Best Web Personality. He is a past Yale University Pointer Fellow in Journalism, and he has lectured at Harvard Medical School, Wharton, Wharton Business School, Columbia Mailman School of Public Health, among others. Um, his writing and videos have been um, featured widely in a number of outlets, the New York Times, Politico, NPR, The Guardian, Mother Jones, Washington Post. Um, and many others. So um, I'd like to invite Dr. Hamblin, as well as all of our esteemed speakers, to the table. And we will begin with um, question and, um, and discussion section. Thanks. As soon as we're seated, um, Dr. Hamblin will um, give a brief presentation here from the from the table. Thanks. No, hello. Um, I like to sit when I talk. Uh, yeah, I uh, forwent my uh, 15 minutes in favor of just answering questions, um, but I did have a couple of thoughts in reaction. Uh, I'm teaching a course now at Yale School of Public Health about getting public health students involved in social media or some form of media. Um, and that stems from the fact that I was doing a residency at UCLA in radiology in 2012. And Twitter was, I'm 36. Twitter was blocked at the university. You couldn't log on to Twitter. Uh, an academic research center just saw it as a waste of time. And so to the point that we are really behind the ball, uh, we are extremely behind the ball. Even the biggest accounts that we have, um, like Yale University's account or even CDC accounts or whatever, ha have far less penetration than the people who've been on social media and were in 2012. Donald Trump was tweeting anti-vax stuff back then. And you know, why does he have 50 million followers now? Lots of reasons, but he was well ahead of UCLA or anyone else at that point. So we have a lot of catching up to do. But the good thing, I think, is that everyone can do it in some way. There are so many different platforms out there and so many different styles of communication. You don't have to be really good at Twitter. You don't have to understand Instagram or Snapchat or anything in particular. You can do YouTube. You can do longer stuff on Facebook. You can start a medium. There's something for everyone. It just requires a little dedication and commitment to figuring out how that platform works and what your target audience is and what you're trying to do, whether you're trying to activate, inform, or sort of just generally engage with more entertaining uh, stuff. And if my idea is that if everyone who came through medical school and schools of public health had a plan, some vague idea of how they were going to reach with their work in their line of interest 100 to 1,000 people on some platform. You don't have to become Dr. Oz. You don't have to be trying to speak to everyone all the time, just some platform. Then we could all come together. The net effect of the informed, educated health community would be to reach a lot of people and to be speaking to them on their terms at their level of um, health literacy on the subjects they care about and meeting them on their phones where they are. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks. I think we'll get started with questions. Thank you for the, your remarks. And um, yes, yeah, so, like um, uh, so I, it'd be great if, if you could bring this. I'm Michael Pasha Orlo, Boston Medical Center um, and Boston University School of Medicine. It'd be great if you guys could bring this uh, a little bit towards health literacy and cancer a little bit more specifically. And um, uh, heaven forgive me for my next statement. And this is to prompt you to reflect. I I've heard it said, I mean, I've read, uh, you know, people are saying, people are writing that windmills cause cancer. You've all heard that? President said that. 
Discuss. <laughs> Uh, I thought the really interesting thing about that was this thing called the backfire effect, um, which we might have actually made worse by covering it so much um, because no one really thought that before. And uh, basically when something gets repeated several times, you know, in the weeks after that, someone remembers reading all the debunkings and it's, it's not in their head. But then five years later or so, those two words are somehow intertwined in their mind. And if you gave them a true false multiple or multiple choice test, some large percentage of people would actually end up choosing the idea that there is some association or there's something to it, not that they're extremely dangerous. But that always walks the line of whether it warrants our coverage and amplification or whether we should stick to just covering the good signs and trying to drive the narrative as opposed to react to it. But what this makes me think of is um, related to the grapevine and where this information comes from. So the example I'll use is a woman who stood up in front of a room of about 250 people and said that every time you eat sugar, your immune system shuts down for five hours. No one batted an eye. So when I got home, I actually went to the literature and looked this up, and I found the Sentinel study linking sugar and immunity. And they found that when you gave sugar to the mice, the macrophages became sluggish for how long? Five hours. So that's what happened. So there, there's probably something related to air loosely, and somehow it gets on the grapevine and it just it goes nuts. So I, I think it's hard to... It, it's hard to um, combat every single instance of that, but I think what I found helpful is to give people the scientific basis of where that probably came from and then talk about what the, what the truth is. I was thinking, oh, I heard that tweet, uh, I think it was on Friday, and I was like, okay, going to work on Monday, it's going to be interesting. And then we didn't hear anything. I mean, I, I didn't. I'm not in the Office of Communication. But I think we generally have such a reactive response to these things, we're not proactive. And this is not just speaking for institutions and, and uh, you know, players here, but even the industry. I mean, this, I think Facebook and Instagram and all these groups are now realizing they have to do more, you know, um, to combat this. And uh, I think we all need to move, you know, the needle by being more proactive about these things rather than waiting for something to completely blow up. And then it stayed in people's consciousness. And five years later, I mean, we've heard these things. Um, I won't mention a few of the topics in the political arena that has come back and repeatedly. They don't just go away. Last thing I would say is I think Ms. Information needs to be treated more as a chronic illness, not a acute. Those of you in medicine think about emergency room handling of a situation versus dealing with it long term. And I think these things are here to stay, and we need to be more proactive. And just to follow that, up, I, I really like that connection to chronic illness scenario. The 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 teach back model when a clinician and a patient are working together and kind of confirming that this is you know we're going to confirm this is the plan checking in and making sure that there's comprehension there also has to continuously be done, you know, all along the way. Do we agree that this is the paradigm? Do we agree that this is the plan? Do we agree? And, and it's going to take a long, lot of effort. So thank you. Um, um, if I could just okay. add one more thing, and that is when, when confronted with um, wild and crazy stories or conspiracy theories. I worked in HIV for a long time, and there are a lot of conspiracy theories in healthcare. The the best way to shut down the conversation is to completely dim dismiss what they're saying. I think you have to let people feel as if you're hearing them because they can't hear the logic that follows if they feel you've disrespected them by not listening to what they to what they have to say. So, uh, Weijin Ko from NCCN again. Thank you for your presentations. Uh, a question for Dr. Charo and Dr. Oransky. You talked about there's a sobering amount of disinformation in the media and on the internet. However, I wonder if we are not inadvertently contributing to that, uh, not, not in a, you know, 
directed way. But you mentioned, I think, Dr. Chow, in one of your questions about how to manage and educate people about uncertainty. And science is inherently and, and cancer is inherently uncertainty. Let me give you an example. We talk about precision medicine. I'm a great believer in precision medicine. If I get on a plane from Philadelphia to go to Seattle, precision tells me I land in Seattle 100% of the time, not 20% of the time, and 30% I make it to Minnesota, You know, 20% I make it to Chicago, 20% I make it to Pittsburgh, and 20% I don't get off the field at all in Philadelphia. So how do we, because we create this premise that makes people question us, and how do we educate these, uh, the, the community? The, next, the other follow-up question is, Many of you have talked about trust and, and as being the important part of communication. So the problem with trust here is that everything that, or many of the things that we link in medical science is linked to marketing. And I think Dr. Oransky talked about that, you know, publishing and stuff. How do we remove that component? Because when the public sees medical information linked to marketing of some kind, that may serve as a barrier to trust. Thank you. I'll start and others can join in. Big questions. I think uncertainty can't be completely dismissed and, and combated. I think it's part of life, it's part of cancer, and I, I think we don't do enough. We, we make this assumption that we can just be clearer. And uh, like, um, even if you think about marketing uh, cancer care, thinking about cancer centers and the way we discuss describe precision medicine, you know, it's very hopeful, it's very scientifically optimistic. Um, there are a lot of truth to that, but at the same time, I wonder if it, we inadvertently give people a sense that there is very little uncertainty about these new modalities of treatment, and that can play into people's need to hear, you know, helpful, hopeful things that they're not hearing from their doctors. So I think as part of a communication effort, if we're trying to improve it, is to really understand where uncertainty lies and focus on how to do a better job at helping people manage and cope, um, just like symptoms or side effects of treatment. It's not something we can just say you will have 30% a chance of not having that. Um, but at the same time, we can't use uncertainty as an excuse not to communicate when we have an opportunity to be clear. Like your prognosis is not good. Palliative care can really help you rather than just focusing on there is a lot of uncertainty as if everything is uncertain. So I think there is a line and that we need to hone in on where that is. Um, others. Yeah, I, I guess part of this is a bit meta, but I, I really think we need to just be more honest starting with ourselves because that's otherwise you're never going to be honest with other people. But uh, you need to be honest about what we know and what we don't. And I, I'm sorry, but, and, and you know, media obviously is complicit, more than complicit in this, but I'll go back to press releases. I'll go back to statements by leading cancer centers. Um, you know, we're always, I don't want to pick on anyone, but I guess by saying this, I'm picking on someone. Um, a moonshot? Like, really? Um, so just be honest about the fact, for example, in my own work with Retraction Watch, you know, basically until quite recently, the line was, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, all that stuff happens, but it's so rare with you, we really shouldn't worry about it. I'm going to call, I, I knew that was BS before I started my work, and so there's confirmation bias for you, except that it's BS. It happens. And never mind fraud, which is what I focus on, the level of uncertainty, the level of failure to reproduce that we see, um, we, we've got to be honest about that, and we've got to be honest in our messaging about that. And, you know, again, I, I, I don't want to, you know, throw wet blankets or what have you, although I do that all the time. Um, precision medicine may turn out to be the, the wonderful thing that we all hope it will be. Um, it's so far from being there now that I think that even expressing hope is almost... You know, sort of, I mean, it's fine to express hope, of course, but I, I think we just need to be honest about that and not be afraid that every time, you know, because if, you, if you're not honest about it and you make everything sound like it's going to cure or do whatever, and then something bad happens, that's when you lose, you, to come back to your second question, that's when you lose trust. So if scientists kept telling us, and people, you know, Dan Koshland got up at, you know, on Capitol Hill and said, you know, oh, it's rare, you know, and fraud doesn't happen. And then it happens. You know that scene from Casablanca, the one I'm sure you all know, you know, I'm shocked, 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 gambling going on here. Oh, you're winning, sir. That's, that's it. They knew that in 1943. Hi, it's Mary Politi from Washington University. Um, 
I love what you said about listening to people, Dr. Fitzpatrick, and hearing their questions because a lot of the misinformation isn't coming from a place of people being dumb or not understanding. It's just misguided or maybe misinterpreting a study or data. Um, My question is also about uncertainty, um, but we've talked a lot about when there's these extreme views like anti-vaccination or air causing cancer or something. And I'm wondering how those of you on the panel who are engaged in social media handle um, legitimate controversy about guidelines or when experts disagree on things like mammography screening age uh, age at start or um, things that have a lot of inherent uncertainty from good data that just is um, uncertain in terms of one recommendation. Um, how do we get that into a sound bites on social media when most people find it much simpler to just say this is the interpretation of the study, this is accurate, this is correct, rather than there's nuance here in the guidelines? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and it's interesting, I've uh, been involved in the science of guidelines specifically almost my entire career. And on some level, you know, the evidence standard for particularly guidelines that for the entire population, something like screening, immunization, that everyone should be subject to, the evidence standard's been raised to an extremely high bar. It's led to complex guidelines, and that's a problem because, uh, you know, it's great to say shared decision-making until you study how well we do share decision-making, and we do it terribly. Um, so uh, one of the ways we've approached it, uh, and obviously we face it all the time, is uh, to really have a good relationship with the other guideline groups. Uh, and to, whenever possible, present the common denominator messaging. Uh, I, it's interesting, uh, Ivan, you, you know, I made this comment about, about controversy. If you look at when we issued our new breast cancer guideline where we changed the age by which every woman should start to 45 from 40, wasn't very popular for many physicians and women. Uh, the common denominator between the gui- all the guidelines is that at 40, a woman should have a discussion about starting. How much was that picked up? Yeah. You know, they, it was just what you said. It was ACS says you don't, you know, start at 45. Right. Guide, uh, task Force says start at 50. No, they all say at 40, you should have that process. So we try to stick, you know, we work incredibly hard, as you can imagine, at shaping our own messaging and getting it out through every vehicle we can uh, I think it pales compared to the New York Times, though, you know, and, and to the front when you're the lead story on NBC Nightly News. It's just, it's hard to completely control that. And treating it, we do treat it as a chronic uh, issue, constantly communicating, constantly communicating. We know that in the first wave, the, the article in the Times will be very good, and very balanced, but the headline will say ACS that started 45. Right. Uh, so... It, it, it's, it's a daily, you know, it's a constant um, strategy to stick to your messaging, try to stay connected with the other organizations so that we find the consistent message. The most important message being too few women are having regular mammograms, you know, get it done, uh, whatever the schedule you pick. Thanks. So the conversations that happen in this room tend to happen at a very high level, but when you when you think about social media information confusing people or making things murky um it's it's not at this level when people are looking for very basic information like i showed on the slide the questions people are asking about cancer is cancer contagious i'd actually never heard i never had a patient ask me that before but i heard that on the street So I think it's the point I'm making about the newscaster who said, the medical news reporter who said we can't give life to these issues. People want basic health information, and that's why I ended my remarks by saying, you know, challenge your assumptions because whoever would would have thought that cancer is contagious? Well, we think that because we're so close to it. But it's really humbling to be out there and see the kind of information people really need. So I think social media is a great place to put this basic information. There's no risk involved. You're not diagnosing someone. You are giving information about how the body works, the difference between cancer and 
chronic bronchitis and so on. So I think we really need to we need to stop being afraid of using social media because you can do so much good just with a little information. So we're just getting started, but you're going to see us on social media answering these questions because people want to know. So you're saying don't worry about these complex controversies. Focus on the basics for the public education. It's, it's a huge need. You could probably answer this as well. I think we need every level, every different approach. There are some people who want to communicate at, you know, uh, journalists who do long-form, complex investigative stories will sneer at the consumer-oriented or uh, daytime TV show type health information. It's not necessarily worse. There's a need sometimes to simplify. There's a need for the complexity, and there's a need for lots of different voices and approaches within various journalistic ethical guidelines of how, how much you can simplify and still be acting uh, responsibly. But also, there's, there's been a lot of talk about information and facts, and most people act on emotion, and we generally do a very bad job of um, finding what it is about a story that makes people have an emotion. Like, the idea that cancer is contagious is terrifying to me, that, and it's also sort of possibly intuitive, I guess, that I could think that it runs in families or there are areas where people get cancer. And I don't know. I just, I, I want to stay away from, there's something about it that could speak to me at a gut level, this uh, intuitive as opposed to analytical reasoning. And most, most people here in this room are very good at analytical reasoning and we forget about the intuitive and how we tell a concise story that generates emotion that sticks with you, that just makes intuitive sense um, as opposed to Complicating. It's really fun to make a complicated long story, but it's not always the best or only approach. And the only quick yeah. thing to add is that a recent study showed about 85 to 90 percent of healthcare professionals are also human beings consuming social. That was humorous. The uh, you know, I mean, the, when when these communications come out, you're not just communicating to the public. You're communi You know, uh, clinicians are not sitting there reading every article. So. There needs to be multi, multiple vehicles, multiple audiences, because that's how many clinicians are getting their information as well. Um, Haley Fuller, Penn Medicine, Lancaster General Health. Um, this kind of hits on a lot of the topics you guys have spoken to, specifically to misinformation. Um, keeping in mind that most of our adults are also adult learners, um, patients are always learning. So in alignment with some of our adult learning theories, adults like to bring in information. It's empowering to them. They like to bring in past experiences. Um, and in the R of misinformation, more and more of that information they're bringing into those visits, into that treatment, might be misinformation. Um, so how can we as a health system and more um, the one-on-one -on -one interaction between the provider and the patient, how can we open an environment so that those misconceptions and that knowledge that's built on misinformation from potentially social media can be brought to the forefront of those clinical conversations? I'll start. Um, 10, 12 years ago, if you look at the literature on internet search and information, um, the literature was very much about doctors saying, please don't bring another printout from what you found online, you know. And it was, a, there was a, a sense that the information gatekeeper, your clinicians, find it uh, threatening or that people are doing self-diagnosis or crowdsourcing their illnesses. And I think the paradigm has shifted. And now I think I shifted in that when patients are showing up with information they've found, um, that's a way they are empowering themselves. And the healthcare system is not giving people the level of hand-holding that they may desire. Um, we can't just dismiss people who bring in information from what they found. It may be an opportunity for some conversation. Maybe they ha they're curious, they're confused, and they're seeking an opportunity to ask some questions. And I think a lot of our communication training, both health literacy work for patients and the ones for physicians, have not adequately taken into account all the tsunami of information that is available, whether it's from your social networks or just from your Google searches. Um, I, I think that it needs to be part of whether it's your decision aid tools, question prompt list, or doctor's training of how to manage questions that patients are, are bringing to the front. And sometimes they're bad information, and I've heard a pediatrician colleagues saying, oh, I'm ready to fire my patient. They're bringing in more 
you know, anti-vax sentiment. And I think that's a really missed opportunity because they are probably bringing in some questions and concerns. They just want to have a conversation. And if we just retreated to our silos further, that's really a shame for, you know, a missed opportunity. And I think I'll, um, I'll just add to that by saying we do have um, models whereby we can think about how we expand the, the traditional clinical care team to include patient navigators, care coordinators, and community health workers who can assist in that process of, you know, answering some of those questions or, you know, demystifying the process or addressing some of the myths that patients may have within that um, clinical care setting. So, you know, thinking outside of kind of those traditional clinical care models, but how do we expand these clinical t care teams so that there are individuals who may have more time to actually address some of the misinformation that, that patients might actually bring to that interaction? Rumi Malasarkar from UCSF again. Um, Dr. Lisa, if I can use your term for yourself, um, I, I really resonated with, um, with what you said about not shutting patients down when they have unusual health beliefs. As a primary care physician, that rings very true to me, and it links to what, uh, to what you said, uh, Sylvia, about um, not shutting patients down when they come in with a big, fat printout. So I had an experience recently where a, a patient came in with huge stack of printouts and was very sheepish about asking me. She was really afraid that I was going to say, I can't believe you Googled your health. And when I said to her, I'm really glad you're engaged in your health. Let's talk about it. She was able to take in information and actually agree to taking medications that I thought would have been a really hard sell knowing her for a long time. And it was just because of that opening in the conversation. And that leads me to my question for Dr. Wender, which is, I have, I have a twofold question for you. So the first is, is cancer.org mobile optimized? Because it is true that every one of my low income patients has a phone and every one of them only uses a phone for internet access. So I think mobile optimization is really important. And for all of you guys who are interested in provision of information online to diverse populations, you should really be thinking mobile first. Um, that's my editorial comment. And then my other question is, are you actively working on how to integrate into patient portals and electronic health records? Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, the first one's easy. Uh, when we updated our uh, website just a couple of years ago, one of the biggest goals was to make sure it was mobile. Uh, worked beautifully on mobile. We're very proud of how it's working now. Please That's take great. a look. That's Play great. with it. I sure will. Email me. Uh, I'd love your feedback, any of you. Um, the, the second question is, I think we have more distance to go in terms of uh, what well, we would, we've used the term an entire digital strategy, which we have a very large one. I mean, big player presence, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. But that's different than really uh, being patient-centric in that digital strategy. Uh, so we're looking mainly at partnerships, because I don't think many organizations have the expertise to do this alone. But there's some amazing companies who engage remarkably well with, with patient groups, caregiver groups, and looking at how we can do that partnership. And the final statement uh, question was about EHR. Uh, and right, um, we're, th the short answer is no. Uh, and there's a lot of barriers to it, not the least of which is that we're, we don't accept PHI and we're not a HIPAA compliant organization and we have to be very careful about where we go with that uh, because that raises a whole nother uh, level for us. Uh, but we, have, we are looking again at partnerships um, where we can uh, brand the partner that it's ACS, but they are the deliverer of a variety of services. Uh, you know, both Len and I would agree that I think one of the biggest challenges that we're looking at right now is how in this increasingly complex cancer environment we can tr more effectively uh, meet the needs of patients and caregivers, which is going to demand harnessing all of these uh, strategies. I, I think the reason that that's really important and worth prioritizing is because 
we as providers are sending our patients to places like cancer.org, which are outside the electronic health record, outside the patient portal, because it's better. It's better communication for them. They're getting what they need. And the patient information that's available within our health system is not meeting their needs. So it would be really important to bridge that gap because, as you said, when we send people outside our walls, we're sending them to the whole internet. And um, it would be much better to have the trusted information actually available within a health system space. Mandy Chapman, uh, GW Cancer Center. So I have two questions. I started with one, but by the time I got up here, I had to. So um, my first question is, I'm intrigued by this idea of kind of sharing the load in terms of um, you know, social media use and, I, and sharing information. I, my question around that is like, how do we do it in a smart way? I think about kind of the tobacco kind of marketing power and our quit lines and our public health strategies and, you know, um, and like, am I just shooting in the dark? I mean, there's rarely a post or tweet that really makes me say, oh, wow, yeah, no, I haven't thought about that, you know? Um, so that's my first one. And then my second one, and I'll sit down. Um, how do we incentivize incentivize academicians, clinicians, and public health folks to, um, to be more health literate and take the time for health literacy that's needed. What I'm, I'm thinking, so in the last year, I've really pivoted to whenever I have a budget, I try to make sure that I pay for um, open source um, articles if I'm publishing so that that firewall is not there to the public, but we make it incredibly difficult for people to obtain information that don't have large um, budgets for licensing. Um, our uh, tenure kind of system doesn't necessarily recognize impact or dissemination and what, how, what we're discovering or doing actually has any kind of reach or impact. We're starting to change that a little bit. Um, I was at a DNI meeting last week, dissemination implementation, and someone actually suggested um, getting rid of the efficacy tri trial, because if it doesn't work in practice, then what's the point? It was a little, I mean, that's a little controversial, but the point is, if something works in a lab but doesn't work in real life, what are we really accomplishing? So again, how do we do social media um, kind of in a smart way, and how do, we, how do we start to build in incentives through value-based purchasing or whatever that would help clinicians have time and prioritize that patient communication and look for understanding and encourage academicians to really um, make an impact with their work, not necessarily just publish. Some of the stories, so we talked, like the New York Times has a great um, megaphone. The Atlantic used to drop on people's doorsteps uh, every month, and that would determine what they read. Now, there are some stories that I write that have 40,000 views and some that have a million. I mean, the differences are vast. And it's not because some of them were on our homepage for a little longer. It's because of social media. And so the most basic way to get involved is to just start sharing some simple stories. You don't even have to comment. You could just say, this is good, this is smart, this is sort of interesting, here are a couple of thoughts I have on it. You don't have to write your own stories or start your own podcast or make your own videos. Um, you can be deliberate in lots of different ways about curating who you're reaching on what platform by sharing stuff that's already out there, but just helping to amplify the good signal and drown out the bad. I know the journalists who work really hard on the articles would really... I <laughs> really appreciate that. We don't need everyone becoming a journalist, but just helping. Everyone's a curator. The reason those things spread to a million people are because that many people, it gets blasted out to listservs or people with tons of Twitter followers tweet it. Um, so you can just be a, a, a curator, a sharer of, of information you think is good or, or things you think are controversial. If people should look at this and share their thoughts on it. Um, start a discussion and engage with, don't just be talking to people, but want uh, interested in hearing from them. Uh, I'm talking too much and we are uh, at the end of time, but I can talk to you after. Very yeah. short on the second part of your question. Uh, I, I think the answer is we need a big solution and not a small one. Uh, I, I think if we as a health community, cancer community, don't uh, start grappling uh, these daunting challenges, which we have today, let alone what it's going to be as the baby boomers age, with totally new workforce solutions, totally new payment models, uh, we're going to be increasing uh, widening in disparities and, and missing equity. 
I know the the academy has dealt with workforce issues before, but I would actually make a plug for having a workshop just on that topic because we can talk about the role that clinicians, whether you're a medical student, a resident, a healthcare administrator, the role that all these different people play in addressing that and where, where does the accountability come from? Because I think that's the biggest issue. When someone walks out of the doctor's office, like my neighbor, I talked about him in a talk a couple weeks ago. He has heart failure, but he walked out of the office thinking he didn't have to take his medicine because he went in for shortness of breath. The doctor didn't explain why heart failure causes shortness of breath, so he's thinking there's nothing wrong with my heart. So I think you're raising a really important point that we can't do justice to, unfortunately. Um, but I'm happy to have lunch with you since you're in D.C. <laughs> Hi. So I, I, um, I shortened your morning break <laughs> this morning. I was responsible for that. So I, I'm going to forego my question because I, I think it's time for the, the break now. But thanks for a great panel. Thanks, everyone.